Good morning, David. Good morning, Salim. David, as you know, I'm a scientist. Then yes. I need, really, I have to ask this question. Can we learn anything from science to benefit risk management? Uh, you know, and maybe the viewers don't know, that actually I too was uh, started my career as a scientist, as a biochemist and then a biophysicist uh, researching into protein structures. And that was my first 10-year career before I discovered r risk management. Um, so, yes, I think we're both scientists and we're both interested in the world of science. Um, there are things we can learn from science, and, and I'm sure you have your own views, which I'm interested uh, to, to hear. Um, what is the basis of science? The basis of science is experiment. Why do we experiment? We experiment because we believe that the world is rational, that the world has underlying structure, that there are rules and principles and concepts which govern the way that the universe operates, that matter is structured, that things are put together, including you, yourself and myself, mm -hmm. and inside our bodies and our brains and, and our, our blood system and so on. Um, and so uh, what we seek to do in science is you have a hypothesis, you have an idea, and then based with the idea, you then design experiments. And the purpose of the experiment is either to prove or disprove yes. the hypothesis. And having done experiments and gathered data and analyzed the data, you improve the hypothesis. And then ultimately, if you have enough data that supports a hypothesis, you end up with a theory, which is still just a theory. What we learn, I think, here is that there's underlying structure, there is something to be discovered, and that by applying a structured approach with creativity, as we spoke about earlier, we can discover some of those things. But the other thing I've learned in my years as a scientist, and then from not being an active scientist, from just watching, is that very often we discover that the things we thought we knew are now known not to be true. Mm -hmm. So I started in biochemistry. Uh, one of my daughters actually, purely by chance, also studied biochemistry mm -hmm. and is a very successful scientist now in her own right. Good. And I once went to her university to spend the weekend and I arrived early. She was in a lecture, so I went and sat in the back of her lecture. And the lecturer was talking about my area of specialism where I did my doctorate. Mm -hmm. So I thought this will be very interesting. And he started off by saying, we used to think this, now we know it's not true. Mm -hmm. And now we have this. And I went, da, 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 that was my speciality. You can't say it's not <laughs> true. I, kn I know. But of course, I knew it and we discovered yes. something new. Yeah. So uncertainty is inherent in the world of science. Even the things yes. we think we know, even our loved theories, yes. sometimes something happens to disprove them. And then we have to review our theories. And so the idea of uncertainty is built into science. Yes that you do the best with what you have, you, you structure it in a way that makes sense, yes. then you always take account of new data. Yeah. And new data then proves or disproves the theory or the hypothesis. Yeah. I think the same is true for risk management. Yes. Uh, what about tools which are used in science? Can these tools really be adapted and used in um, risk management? Certainly analytical tools can, mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea of statistics and probability theory and so on originated from you know, the study of the physical world. Yeah. Um, and so those sorts of tools, I think, are, are very simple to adapt. Um, some of the heavy technology tools, maybe not, but the ideas behind them. Um, I was talking to, uh, this may sound odd, but a, a scientist in Vatican City in Rome mm -hmm. who works for the Pope, uh, who is a Monsignor of uh, Philosophy of Science. And he is um, expert in nanotechnology, actually in pico technology, mm -hmm. uh, and was talking about the use of waveguides to, to create pico waves, yes. which can then be used to create very fast processes that have no, use no energy and, and generate no heat. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, and this is happening in the Vatican. Who, who would think yes. it? Um, and um, I was thinking, well, how does this help me in risk management? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the idea of, a, of a, a molecule level or atom level waveguide in quantum terms is no help to me at all, mm -hmm. unless I'm in, you know, in that particular field. But the idea that you could have a waveguide and the waveguide creates phases within the waveguide and you have phase alignment, which is unexpected, where you, th you think that things will go through the waveguide unrestricted, but they generate their own phases naturally. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes. 
And so could we adapt that principle mm. into risk management that mm. says, let's have a process mm. that provides a waveguide mm -hmm. and we put our risk creativity, our identification into the waveguide, we add our data to the stream yeah. and we see if packets of information emerge at the other end. Yeah. And so naturally by, by um, just the interactions of the data as they pass through the process. Mm. Now that is a stimulating thought that came from a, a discussion and then lunch with this Monsignor in the Vatican, yes. which is thinking about quantum theory yes. and his particular application of it, yes. but nothing to do with developing super fast processes, yes. but thinking about the idea in a different setting. Yes, also <coughs> in physics and chemistry. Uh, we do have, for example, one can study just an atom, isolated atom. Then uh, you can have a cluster of atoms mm then the characteristics or features will be different yes. because there are some interaction between these atoms between themselves. Then you can have even a big cluster. Then you'll have the whole system or many body theory, for example. Okay? Yes. All of these are similar when uh, you are studying um, <coughs> an individual risk mm. and you go to the, a little bit a group of people, a team, to a corporate level. Yes. So I'm assuming that uh, there are similarities when one can learn from these uh, similarities. Yes, I'm sure that's right. Um, the thing is, I think we need some wisdom in applying uh, these principles outside of the places that they came from, mm -hmm. because an analogy, which is what we call it, uh, yes. you, you take this and this is a similar situation, but yes. not, the, not the same. Analogies uh, often have limitations. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can say, this is true of the physical situation to do with material science. Yeah. And that is like what happens when we take a risk and look for its connections with other risks yeah. and we develop connectivity and groups of risks yeah. which have additional characteristics from the, the atomic risk. Yes. <coughs> you have molecular yes. risk and then you have structure risk and, and phase risk and matrix risk and so yes. on. And then whole body risk uh, or overall project risk or overall organisational risk as we talked about earlier. But I think you can stretch the analogy too far and you can talk about X-ray crystallography and you can talk about, um, you know, some of your surface science technology, yes. which just doesn't apply, you yes. know. So we have to be careful not to stretch the analogy too far. Yes, <coughs> yes. If you remember, we were talking about uh, the disturbing of a system. Perturbing, yes. <coughs> perturbing of a system. That methodology or approach also can be used in this uh, risk management yes. in trying to understand or risk identification. So you have a system, you try to disturb that system and um, then you see the response uh, from that uh, system. Yes. I, I believe this also can be maybe uh, applied in risk management. Yes, I think you call it intruder theory, don't uh, you? Exactly. Um, yes. And we can use that idea in building a system dynamics model and system dynamics is a quite advanced analytical methodology for quantitative risk analysis, where you build a system, uh, a model, which represents your situation as a system, whether it's an organization or a decision or a project or a society or community. You build a system which has interrelations between it. You allow the system to reach a steady state where things are relating to one another in a way that, that works and continues to work, and then you drop in a disturbance. Uh, so you might say in my organization, what happens if a key supplier withdraws their labor? Mm -hmm. And in the model, you take that out and the system becomes unstable and everything yes. moves and you can watch the different parts moving. Then it reaches a new steady state. And so you can see the overall effect, overall, of one particular change. And we could do the, actually simulate uh, the withdrawal of a, uh, a supplier over a period of time they reduce their involvement, they reduce it further, then they exit the market. Yes. So you can actually do trend analysis. Yes. So the idea of using system dynamics models yes. to model intruder theory, I, I think is quite interesting. Thank you very much, David. It's fascinating, and we could talk about this all day, couldn't we? Uh, but, but we mustn't. Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you.